Yes, the, the government recommended diet based on the, uh, the food pyramid um, has way too much carbohydrate for any diet that we've ever followed naturally. I'm not sure all the processes that went into the development of that, but one thing is certain, there's no natural existing diet that mimic that. Uh, there's no native society that we've ever encountered um, that followed that kind of a diet. Late 70s, early 80s, the eat less fat message really started being uh, fed, <laughs> for lack of a word, to the American public. You know, we cut the fat, everything's going to be better. And beginning at about that same time, the incidence of type 2 diabetes in this country began to go up. And we're not talking a little up now. It's a, it's a curve that, well, from your perspective, would look like this. I mean, it's a very, you know, a Thunderbird jet taking off. I mean, it's a very steep climb to that curve. <clears throat> and the, the kind of dangerous aspect to that is that it's not just, we used to call that adult-onset diabetes. We don't call it adult-onset diabetes anymore because we see it in 8- and 10-year-olds now uh, that are developing type 2 diabetes in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th grade who are obese, who are diabetic, who are young. Uh, and the, the adult population is, the, the numbers are just astronomical for the number of diabetics and prediabetics now versus 1980. Where do you begin to talk about the negative effects of sugary and starchy diets? which are actually both the same because starch is obviously just glucose molecules hooked into long chains. The GI tract immediately breaks them apart, actually starting with spit in your mouth. You can do a little easy experiment. Take a cracker, put a little piece of it in your mouth, and just hold it and let your saliva work on it for a minute, and very quickly it starts to taste sweet because starting at this very first end of your GI tract, you're changing starch into sugar. So a starchy and a sugary diet is kind of the same thing. And so, in essence, you're just eating sugar. Now, people say, well, they're complex carbohydrates. And that's true in the sense that they're hooked up as starch, but all starch is is a chain of glucose molecules hooked together. And as soon as it hits the GI tract, the GI tract breaks it down into, into glucose, into, into basically blood sugar. And that's the GI tract's job, and it does it really well. When it gets a hold of that stuff, it breaks it down, and that's why blood sugar rises really quickly with, with bread and with, uh, with potatoes and with rice and with all these starchy foods. And despite the fact that people say they're complex carbohydrates, they really run the blood sugar up almost as quickly as, as regular sugar. You know, skim milk with, with a, a, a fat-free bagel and some jelly, for breakfast and a banana. Let's throw that banana in. I mean, it's just, it's a breakfast made of sugar. If you ask most people, how much, how much sugar you have in your blood? If you've got normal blood sugar, how much sugar is that dissolved in your blood? People don't have a clue. You know, I'll get answers like a cup or two cups. The amount of blood sugar in your blood, if you have a normal blood sugar, is a little bit less than one teaspoon. One teaspoon of sugar dissolved in your entire blood volume gives you a normal blood sugar. Well, sugar is actually quite toxic. Uh, glucose is, a, uh, is the toxic molecule to uh, the glomerular cells in the kidney, the, the, the filtering apparatus in the kidney. And it's toxic to a lot of cells uh, in the body. Another thing that, that uh drives heart disease or drives endothelial dysfunction, which ends up uh, leading to heart disease in a lot of people, is elevated blood sugar. That's why diabetics have a much, much higher rate of heart disease than non-diabetics because they've got higher blood sugar levels. And blood sugar is absolutely toxic to the endothelium. Now, it's not toxic in normal doses, but it's toxic when you get out of those normal doses. And interestingly, some, some very... Um, Good research work has been done looking at, at blood sugar even within what's perceived as the normal range, and people at the higher end of, of the normal range have more heart disease than people at the lower end of the normal range when you control for everything else. So blood sugar is a real driving uh, force for the development, first of endothelial dysfunction and then heart disease. The human body was not designed to have its insulin elevated all the time. It was an, a hormone of 
emergency as far as blood sugar is concerned. And we're using it to control our blood sugar minute by minute. The, the control of minute by minute blood sugar should be under the control basically of the liver and of glucagon, insulin's counter-regulatory hormone. We should be having to elevate our blood sugar a little bit during the day by making new blood sugar out of protein. We absolutely should not be having to knock it down after every meal with a big bolus of insulin. The body wants the blood sugar kept in a very narrow range. Insulin has many jobs, but the most critical in terms of sustaining life is to keep the blood sugar in a really narrow range. If the blood sugar goes up, I mean, we're not going to pitch over on our faces, but if it goes too high, we certainly can. Uh, we can develop all kinds of problems quickly, including death. I mean, in, in the matter of a couple of days, if blood sugar just goes skyrocketing. So insulin, to keep us alive, focuses on the blood sugar really more than anything else, and everything else is secondary. And so what if it's putting fat in the fat cells? It doesn't care if it's keeping blood sugar down. Humans throughout their history ate, ate, ate foods that were not big blood sugar makers. You know, uh, it, on a diet that's mostly uh, animal, animal protein and fat and fairly carb uh, poor, and with a fair amount of fiber from the kinds of vegetables that they would have had to eat, the roots and shoots and the nuts and the berries. Um, that's a, a diet that's designed to keep blood sugar pretty, pretty level. In fact, you might have to make some blood sugar. So insulin was there to keep blood sugar from going too high in the event that it ever would, which it usually didn't. It was not a thing that, that early man had to deal with. The Inuit Indians, for instance, live off of nothing but whale blubber and seal fat for six months out of the year, but have virtually no maturity onset heart disease until they give up that lifestyle and they move into modern cities and they start eating a lower fat diet and then they develop heart disease at a very high rate. Uh, we find virtually no heart disease in, in other Native Americans that Westerners lived with. We cohabited with them for 200 years or so before they changed their culture. And um, they didn't even have a word for maturity onset heart disease in the language. It was virtually non-existent. Now some of the highest rates of heart disease anywhere on the planet are in American Indians living in reservations. Some reservations in the Southwest have a 50% diabetes rate among the adults highest anywhere in the world. I think that's because they made their change from hunter-gatherer diet towards the lower fat, higher carbohydrate intake of the modern West all of a sudden in a single generation. Okay, has anybody not been to one of these groups before? They've all been here. Good, okay. I'll skip the provisos, but uh, um, my qualifications here, and we've all talked about uh, what lowering carbs and increasing fats can do, both in terms of lowering weight, but it also has a great effect on blood sugar. Uh, so we all need to understand what diabetes is, because whether we're subject to it or not, we will know somebody in our life who is. Uh, given that, as you saw in some of the earlier statistics, uh, half of the adult population is already pre-diabetic or diabetic. Uh, there's some estimates that by 2050, uh, we will have 75% of the population pre-diabetic or diabetic. Okay. It's clearly on the rise, and it has everything to do with what we've been eating. And it, you haven't gotten a clue by now, but pay close attention. Okay. Uh, so diabetes is the inability of the body to properly manage carbohydrates. And as you heard in the video, uh, we were not designed to have a lot of carbohydrates on board to begin with. We can survive on carbohydrates if we're starving or have no other source of calories. But to be healthy, we really need to be eating far more fats and proteins and only occasional carbohydrates. Unfortunately, in today's world, 90% of the population gets most of their uh, calories from carbohydrates. 
Uh, so we're having this constant onslaught. Uh, let's make the distinction between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Anybody know anybody with type 1 diabetes? Okay. You know somebody or are somebody? No, I, I know someone, a young child who's 8. Yep. Yeah. And really same thing, you know somebody? Yes, I do. Okay. Anybody here ah, have type 1? Okay, yeah. you know somebody who does. That's also on the increase, and we don't know why. Uh, generally speaking, it's a small percentage of the population, uh, under 5%, I think probably more like 2%. Uh, 5 to 10. 5, 5 to 10? Uh, 5 to 10 percent of, of people with diabetes. With diabetes right. right. So at least uh, probably a third of that then. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's not frequent, but it does happen, and it's happening more. It used to be called juvenile diabetes because um, it's the kind of diabetes that occurs uh, early in life. It can occur as early as under five. Uh, yeah, and, and in fact, I've, people I've seen little be, babies with a little uh, insulin right. pumps on their bones. Wow. Yeah, so you, you can actually be, almost be born with it, right? Yeah. Well, there's actually people type one as an adult. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, yeah, and that's and possible. Right. Typical onset is in adolescence, okay. but as you point out, I, I work with somebody who became type 1 in her 50s. Okay. And I, I kept saying, you know, are you sure this is type 1? She said, yep, and explained the whole thing. So it can happen anytime. Type 1 comes from a loss of beta cells in your pancreas. Those are the cells that are responsible for producing insulin. Uh, normally we're born with plenty of them and they work all throughout our life and we don't have to worry about it. But for some reason, uh, some people have what's essentially an autoimmune disease. In other words, the body is attacking its own cells and it kills its own beta cells. When your beta cells die, you don't produce insulin. And when you don't produce insulin and you have carbohydrates, what happens? Remember what they're saying about too many carbohydrates in the blood? It's toxic and you can die? Well, that's what can happen. Uh, they, they go, uh, uh, often they discover that they have type 1 diabetes when their blood sugar goes sky high and there's no explainable reason. They're not eating anything out of the ordinary. Um, what's happened is their beta cells are no longer functioning and they're losing the natural insulin that they would get. Um, so if you don't produce insulin, and you're type one, what do you have to do? Take Fix the problem. Take yeah, you've got to inject insulin. You've got to give yourself uh, your own insulin. And that's, you know, type one person lives with that condition all their life. I, I know I worked with another woman who had type one diabetes since adolescence, and she was uh, well into her 60s when I first met her. And she, though she had an insulin pump, Okay, that's an internal source of insulin. Um, she would have to take her blood sugar frequently throughout the day and balance the amount of insulin that she released uh, with the amount of carbohydrates that she was eating. And if you pay close attention to it, uh, essentially every day, all day long, I mean, it's, a, it's an awful condition to have Especially to if you don't be eat paying enough. attention. Pardon me? Like with her, she eats and drinks soda. She has chips, she yep. has oh, and, and so she's constantly playing with it. Right. She has to adjust the amount of insulin. She has and, to you know, <coughs> people are not necessarily told to eat fewer carbohydrates. They're just told to balance the insulin with the amount of carbohydrates you eat. But there um, is an author, uh, Dr. Bernstein, I can't remember his first name, um, but he's published a book, and well known, he's in his 80s now. Uh, he's been type 1 diabetic all his life, but he advocates for a low carbohydrate approach, basically saying, why keep pumping insulin when in fact if you cut your carbohydrates, you won't have as much of a problem. You, know, you still have to take some insulin, but you can keep the amounts way down. Uh, so there are different ways to think about dealing with type 1 diabetes. Um, are people with type 1 uh, heavy or thin? Well, they can, be, they can become heavy if they're getting a lot of insulin and eating a lot of carbs, just the way the rest of us do. But very, most frequently you'll see type 1 diabetics is quite thin because they have a hard time putting, keeping weight on. Remember, you have to have insulin in order to create fat in, in your body. 
So if you don't have any insulin and you're having to add it, you're not as likely to put weight on it in that respect. So the condition that affects most people is type 2 diabetes. And type 2, two diabetes is something that we acquire over time. It's not something that we're born with, though we may be born with the, the tendency to develop it. And type 2 diabetes, here's the, the risk factors. Over, age over 45. The older you get, the more likely you are to develop it. Uh, being overweight, uh, especially carrying a lot of weight in your center core. Um, being physically inactive. Uh, having high blood pressure or abnormal cholesterol because type 2 diabetes is part of what we called before the metabolic syndrome. That is to say, diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol cluster together because they all derive from insulin resistance. Okay? Um, family history. Okay? There are some groups of people throughout the world who tend to have higher rates of diabetes. Okay. Um, and having had gestational diabetes for a woman during pregnancy, uh, if you've had gestational diabetes, your chances of acquiring type 2 diabetes later on in life are higher. Okay. I'd like to add two things to that list. I find that genetics is like a loaded gun. Yes, you know, the tendency is there, but the environment is what pulls the trigger. Mm. So it doesn't have to go off, but we live in a very high carb world here in America, so it tends to be the issue. Um, family history, I make the argument, is it nature or nurture? Is it, is it the genetics? Yes, partly, but also we learn the habits of our family, and we have the same lifestyle as our family. So if our family is big, then we tend to be big because we've adopted those habits. If we change those habits, we can reverse them. My childhood friend has diabetes. She's Latino, and they have big, big right mm -hmm. and she has so much trouble. And really, what I advise is the portion of rice for a meal, the max, but besides your fist. I don't know. I never eat them. And I love them too, but I see her. And that's her life. Yeah, yeah. And the, so diabetes has been thought to be a progressive disease yeah. because if you don't change anything, it's going to continue on yeah. the way yeah. it has been continuing. Is that just white rice or, or? white and brown rice have the same amount of starch? How about the, the um, wild rice? They're all going to have approximately the same amount of starch. Okay. Um, about 45 grams of carbs in a cup. So you think the size of this? Right, that would be the max. And that is individual for each person. So mm -hmm. Dave <laughs> could never tolerate that right. at all. I really can't tolerate that much either. But for someone who is cutting back from two, three cups in a meal, cutting back from one cup can make a really big difference. So when glucose increases in the bloodstream, it begins to damage the artery walls, as you heard in the video. Uh, it begins in the smallest capillaries, the back of the eye, kidneys, and around nerve endings, and can result in blindness, kidney failure, failure of neuropathy. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, half of people who have heart attacks have diabetes. Mm -hmm. And some researchers believe that everyone who has a heart attack has diabetes. They just didn't know it. Mm -hmm. And because what we're talking about is damage to the epithelium. That's the lining of blood vessels throughout the body, including in the heart itself. And that that damage can result in uh, chronic uh, 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 congestive heart failure and other forms of heart disease. So that a person develops symptoms and is often treated for heart disease, but no one takes a look at their insulin resistance, that is, are they really underneath that diabetic? Um, so we're discovering more and more things about blood sugar and its effect on all kinds of diseases. We'll talk some more next week when we talk about sugar, about cancer and about Alzheimer's. Okay? Uh, so the bottom line is 
keeping sugar out of your blood should be your number one priority. All right. Um, so when people have a heart attack, they put it on a low fat diet, and when they have diabetes, they put it on a low carb diet. So what's left? Right. Protein and veggies. Mm -hmm. I love them, but they're very bland, especially if they don't have butter. <laughs> so right. really. The reason why diabetes and heart disease are closely linked is because they're caused by the same thing. So there really is no need to be worrying about that. If we worry about sugar and refined carbs more, then we're going to run into uh, the fact that your weight, your diabetes, your cholesterol, everything will resolve, all, uh, well not resolve, but they, it will improve all at the same rate. Right. I often see people's cardiac risk improve at the same time as anyone sees. Huh. So, and, and if you're on a high protein diet and you don't need all that protein, what does protein convert to? Carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. okay. So, it's kind of self-defeating uh, approach to, to heart disease in that regard. And, uh, uh, which gender has more heart disease without knowing about it? Females, okay. Men are, uh, you know, are studied more for heart disease, have classic symptoms, you know, the the, the pain down the left arm, etc. You know, the, the crushing feeling on the chest. Whereas women, oftentimes, their symptoms are nausea, um, and women tend to ignore their symptoms because they're trying to do other things and take care of other people. Uh, so they go longer uh, with those symptoms, uh, when in fact what may be going on is they really have unresolved uh, insulin resistance that's causing all this. And they're following, women are, are much better at following dietary recommendations, right? That's why most of the people here are women, because women pay attention to what the experts say. And what do the experts say about what you should be eating? Low fat, high carb. So they're getting all the wrong advice and getting the symptoms and dying of heart disease, and no one's telling them where it comes from. And this is just a, the most bizarre arrangement that the American Heart Association won't come clean on this because they've been advocating for low fat, you know, for years, and they don't want to change their tune. So they're starting to. It's interesting the way they're doing that is by saying you should get sugar out of your diet. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't say that lots of things produce sugar. You put a cracker in your mouth, you've got sugar in your mouth now, okay? So they'll kind of come around in time. And if you read the whole history, of it, you'll understand why the Heart Association went for low fat, uh, because they were, they were paid researchers feeding them information to say that don't look at fat as, uh, as uh, sugar is the problem, look at fat. But that's a whole other story. I think some of that's in an article there. Uh, so, in order to manage diabetes, you need to either lose weight or have gastric bypass surgery. Um, quit smoking, be more physically active, lower stress, etc., all those things. But diet is by far the single most biggest contributor to the development of diabetes. Um, so, what does the National Institute of Health recommend? <coughs> well, some good things, more fruits and vegetables, fewer high-fat foods. Ooh. Um, choose whole grains, even though, as you just heard, uh, whole grains like brown rice is going to have just as many carbs as white rice. Um, almost, almost, it's about a 4% difference. Um, cereals, brown rice, oatmeal, barley, uh, and then fish, but lean meat, and foods that have been baked, broiled, or grilled, not fried. You don't want to have fats in your diet. And drink water instead of juice, that's fine. And low fat or skim milk. What you get out of the nutritional recommendations uh, to avoid diabetes or to deal with it if you have it is a low fat, high carb diet. Um, so what we know is low fat diets resulted in um, more effective weight loss than low carb diets, that's wrong. Eating whole grains um, is, will not raise blood sugar, that's wrong. 
and consuming a little bit of skim milk um, had less diabetes, that's wrong. All of that has been disproven by good research. Um, to prevent a control diabetes, reduce the demand for insulin by lowering your intake of carbohydrates. A low carbohydrate diet, regular fasting, and we'll talk about fasting in a minute, um, or having your stomach reduced through bariatric surgery. Um, anybody know anybody who's had that? Uh, anybody want to say that they've had it? I've had people in the group who have. It's uh, Right now there's a huge billboard on Route 195 as you come through Fall River from New Bedford. Uh, something about the, the new you, and it has a picture of a guy uh, who's massively overweight and then um, having had his uh, stomach reduced. Why? Because the hospital system is uh, advertising bariatric surgery. How big you have to be to have surgery? Well, there are criteria. Uh, typically, we're talking a BMI of 35 or more, okay. what's called morbidly obese. Okay. You have to be well overweight. And you are put on uh, diets and counsel ahead of time. Uh, so that it's not simply the surgery. Uh, it's not like the people who go up to the uh, cardiac catheterization unit every time they have a heart attack, get their arteries reamed, <laughs> and then go back to eating just the way they did before because they figured, well, the surgery will take care of it. Uh, bariatric surgery is not the solution. And for people who have been very overweight and been trying to reduce uh, their weight through dietary means, it can be a reasonable solution, uh, particularly if it means uh, not going on to develop uh, uh, other things like heart disease and, and dying of being overweight, essentially. Okay. You want to add anything about that? Well, I have seen people come through from the uh, bariatric surgery uh, program, a number of different programs, I don't have any names other than South Coast. Um, and other programs, it seems that they don't have as a rigorous um, process to get through to the surgery. So, like, I will, I will say, I do highly regard our bariatric program. If anybody is going to do the surgery, they should do it here. And I'm not just advertising; it's just a, a professional uh, opinion that they make you go through a number of meetings with a dietitian. They make you go through psychology, uh, you know, uh, the psychiatrist meetings. They want to make sure you're ready because this is going to force you to make, you know, these dietary changes. But um, I've, I've actually had a patient come to me because she was going through this bariatric, uh, she was going to have the surgery and she needed to see a dietitian. I said, well, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert <laughs> on bariatric surgery. I'll help you, but doesn't your program have a dietitian? Apparently not. So, you know, if, if anybody's gonna get bariatric surgery, I definitely uh, endorse South Coast, but um, I also give people the other option that they can take um, changes into their own hands and follow a low carb diet and make the changes that aren't so permanent, but still get results. So a lot of times they will take me up on my offer. They wanted me to have bypass surgery, and I said, in my reach, I don't think so. Well, and it's a decision, so, right. So I, that's what, yeah, I met you. Yep. And uh, there's a woman who works with uh, patients on, uh, with diabetes, uh, Sarah Hallberg, out in uh, Indiana. And she wrote a uh, New York Times editorial that said, uh, um, essentially, uh, before you spend twenty-six thousand dollars on bariatric surgery, try this. Yeah. Okay. And and her point is that many, not all people who are going to bariatric surgery, if they give low carb diets a good try, they find out that they can actually lower their weight substantially without the surgery. And lest anybody think that the surgery is it, it no. it's not only a year of preparation, but Afterwards, you're having to follow specific diets because of, of, of that. And, pardon me? Yeah, uh, about a quarter of the people gain the weight back again, even, but it doesn't undo the surgery. I know someone who did. Yeah. 
I do too. Right? Good. Yeah. It's, uh, so it's not a guarantee. Now, the point is that um, in terms of diabetes, if you if you had diabetes and then had the surgery, what they discovered, and I don't think they were really anticipating this would happen, but that uh, the diabetes condition that people had just disappeared they in a matter of why. days. Yeah, they, I don't right. think they have pinpointed why that happened. Right. I know three people that that happened to. Exactly. So people end up with no diabetes, you know, even before they've lost a substantial amount of weight. Well, if you understand something about insulin resistance, it does make perfect sense. It's not weight that causes people to maintain diabetes. It's insulin resistance. And insulin resistance goes away when you stop putting a demand on your pancreas to keep producing insulin over and over and over again. Remember I've said before that uh, your cells become resistant when they're just tired of taking in all this sugar over and over again without a, a rest. Um, let's talk about fasting for a few minutes here. Um, well, um, have I told you guys about the subway car? The subway car is really, you know, that analogy of the platform being your bloodstream, too many people there, you know, it gets crowded, things get broken damage to the arteries, and then you have the people being escorted by insulin over to the subway cars, to your muscle cells, your organ cells, or your fat cells, and if you have too many people, blood sugars, getting shoved into these subway cars and not enough people leaving because they're not exercising, then the subway cars get really overfilled and your insulin becomes more of a subway pusher. And so a subway pusher are paid officials in Japan that will shove as many people to capacity into a subway car before it will drive off. So your body is trying to cram as much sugar into your cells as possible, um, you know, trying to get it out of its bloodstream. So cutting back on carbohydrates is one way to reduce the number of people getting into the subway car. Exercising is another way to get people to leave the subway car. And fasting is a very efficient way to stop the insulin insulin pushing or the insulin resistance. So that's insulin resistance, and, and that tends to go away when you take away carbohydrates, right? Mm -hmm. So you think about it, bariatric surgery is nothing but enforced fasting. Okay? Yeah. So the same thing happens in fasting as happens in bariatric surgery. The question is, do you want to go through that procedure? in order to do something you can do without the procedure. And that, that's fasting. Um, this is insulin resistance. The cells become resistant through overstimulation. Um, eventually the pan pancreas will stop producing insulin and then you're into uh, advanced forms of type two diabetes. But fasting reverses the process by giving the cells a chance to recover from resistance. So, Typically, what happens is that we eat a high-carb diet. Um, we have constant high gl glucose in the blood, blood sugar, and the demand leads to increased insulin levels. The constant high insulin demand results in insulin receptors becoming resistant, or what's called down-regulated. Okay? And then, in the end, uh, you become hungry, uh, and that insatiable hunger leads to more carbohydrates, more insulin demand, more downregulation, et cetera. So it becomes a vicious cycle after a while. So that's why people who are type 2 diabetic are always hungry because of this process, but they gain weight because they're constantly putting a demand for insulin on their uh, pancreas. So we all fast, said before, we, you fasted last night unless you were up all night eating and you broke the fast with breakfast this morning. Um, so our bodies are used to having a period of time when we go without any demand for insulin. That's a good thing. We need a rest period between the time that we uh, demand insulin and the time that we um, do not. 
and that is called fasting. Typically, we fast between meals. However, what's happening to the American diet these days? Snacking all the time. Right. Snacking. It's a continuous meal, okay? <laughs> and we even we reinforce that uh, with our kids in school as well, uh, because we give them snacks in mid-morning, lunch. We first we feed them a high carb breakfast of cereal, and then a snack at uh, 10 30 or whatever, and then a, a lunch at 11 30, 12 o'clock, then another snack afterwards, and then they come home and have another have another snack. Their bodies are just being assaulted with carbohydrates all day long. And we wonder why they become insulin resistant. So Surgery does the same thing as fasting. Fasting is simply not putting a demand uh, on your system for insulin. Um, Jason Fung is probably the best known proponent of this. If you go on dietdoctor.com, you can listen to all kinds of talks that he does, some very technical and others. He does a very good job of explaining this in layman's terms, in terms of what's going on. But he also treats hundreds of people with diabetes, including people with very severe diabetes. He treats them with periods of fasting. Um, so what works with fasting? Well, you want to have some liquids available, uh, things like bone broth, water, things of that sort of fine. But what you don't want to do is stimulate your insulin. Okay? So basically, you stop eating for a period of time. What's the problem when people stop eating? They get hungry, okay? And most people will not go into fasting because of hunger. However, what you need to do is to push past a period of hunger. Now, people will say, well, I can't possibly do that. Well, you can't until you try it, all right? Um, and when you do try it, you will find out that your hunger does not last forever. Most people think, well, I'll just get hungrier and hungrier and hungrier and hungrier. No, you reach a point. Has anybody gone without food long enough to realize that your hunger starts to go away? That's true. Yeah. Okay. And I need blood work to be done. Yeah, I exactly. Good when point. When I go and I don't you're, eat you're until to, noon to time fast, or something, right. I feel a lot better. For 12 also. hours. What happens? You feel better. Yes. Right, yes. exactly. Right. Because what that's doing is giving your insulin system a rest. Yes. And that's what we're talking about. It's going for a long enough period of time to knock back your insulin. So your insulin receptors on your, in, uh, on your cells that are normally receiving insulin get a chance to relax a little bit. Okay, so that's an important part of that. Um, so fasting can go anywhere from, uh, an easy fast is just skip breakfast, you know, do a 12 hour fast. Some people limit their eating period to eight hours. Okay. Um, some people limit their eating to six hours. You might have two meals. Okay. You might fast for 24 hours, you might fast for 48. Typically after 48 hours, hunger has gone completely, okay? And people experience a surge in energy and a clarity of mind. That's why lots of religious people and people who fast for spiritual reasons do that because of that clarity of mind that you get. Uh, and they've just simply discovered that and then do that deliberately. Um, how long can you fast? What's the length of time? You're, if you're otherwise healthy? A month? Yeah, 30, 40 days or so. Uh, what you don't want to do is start losing muscle mass. Okay, And after a period of time, your body will look to your muscles for calories. Uh, but short of that, remember Gandhi? He used to go on long fasts. I don't know. Who else uh, do we know of who's done fasting? Yeah. We talked a little bit about uh, Ramadan and how people, that's just a 12 hour fast uh, during days. But you don't hear much about fasting these days. No, no, no. But Dr. Fong has been using it as a treatment. And he's taken people with um, A1Cs, we talked about that, above 6.5 is diabetes. People who have A1Cs of 12, 13, 14, and brought them down to. 6.5 or under without medication, simply by fasting. Okay, it's that powerful a technique. Unfortunately, you can't sell fasting the way you could sell medications, so nobody advocates for it. Plus, there's a natural 
uh, built-in resistance to fasting. If your doctor, your doctor already tells you to fast for 12 hours before your blood work, what if he said do 24 hours? Would you do it? I did kind of hard. Kind of hard. Okay. Under the right circumstances, people do. Okay. That's why I wanted to say that. Um, with that constant snacking, we, we put ourselves into that routine of constantly snacking because we're eating so low fat and so high carb. Carbs burn up in an instant and we're ready for more. So if you're grazing on continuous carbs, like my son at the moment, <laughs> um, then uh, of course you're going to be hungry in two or three hours. I have some people who I recommend waiting until two hours after their meal to test their blood sugar again. And then sometimes they snack before they get a chance to test their blood sugars. Yes? When I first had a challenge, I was 20 pounds, eating every three hours. I thought I gave me this advice, more meals, the right mm -hmm. food, and I lost 20 pounds in three months, eating every three hours. Right, and that's a low, low fat, high carb yes. diet. And it, works, but well, was it me. sustainable? Was it sustainable? Excuse me? Was it sustainable? Were you able to eat like that for the rest of your life? Mm -hmm. Nah. That's the problem. I try. It works, <laughs> but it's hard to maintain that. This is a little easier because you don't have to feed the, the fire all exactly. the time. I you only have food out. How is that? I only had food in my stomach. Right. So the, when you switch away from high carb to, uh, to high fat instead, low carb, then you will end up having a much more even blood sugar, right? And so we don't have those blood sugar crashes. We don't feel the hunger the same way. I mean, I, I describe high carb hunger as feed me now or I'm going to stab you in the eye, right? <laughs> it is intense. It comes on quick. You get lightheaded. And it's like, boom, now, right? Very cheeks. intense. Cheeks. What? Cheeks. 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 Yeah. Cheeks. Yeah, because your blood sugar is plummeting and it's like, and your body is getting, giving you a very clear signal. When you are eating low carb and high fat, now the fat is really stabilizing your blood sugars. And that's why I really push fat as much as I do because you will notice that the hunger is so different. I found that immediately. Mm -hmm. yeah. I found. God, I'm not hungry like that. Right. Yeah. And that's what we want to do. We want to get our bodies back to a place where blood sugar is fluctuating like this, not like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so whether you're diabetic or not, that's the goal. And that will keep uh, insulin resistance down. And so when you get to the point where your, your hunger is very slight and it's more subtle, like, oh, I'm kind of hungry. Oh, she eats soon, you know, that kind of thing. That's where fasting is a lot easier. Right. Yeah. So the so combination all, works right. very well. Exactly. So if you're already on a high fat diet, fasting won't be the problem that you would normally anticipate. Okay. So, um, bottom line to prevent or manage diabetes, if you don't have it, eat like you did to prevent it. Okay. <laughs> In other words, everybody. If the whole population was on a high fat, low carb diet, diabetes would go back to where it was 40 years ago before we started advising people to, to eat lots of carbohydrates when it was six or eight percent of the population. Now it's 14 and climbing, okay? Um, let me just read the cartoons for you since you probably can't from where you're sitting. This one says, uh, give it to me straight, doc. How long do I have to ignore your advice? <laughs> Second, I, I think diabetes is affecting my eyesight. I have trouble seeing the consequences of poor food choices. <laughs> and finally, the doc says to his patient, you can enjoy diabetes, high cholesterol, and hypertension, or you can suffer from good health. <laughs> so hopefully all of you know enough now to suffer from good health, okay? Um, we're gonna talk next week about sugar, and next week is your birthday, I understand. Yay. Even though Amanda won't be here next week.
next week. She'll be up in New Hampshire celebrating. We're going to have a cake in her honor. Okay? And you'll get to see a different kind of taste, a different kind of birthday cake. Okay? And it will answer the question of what do I do when my child or grandchild or next door neighbor has or I want to put on a party for somebody, do I have to bake a usual high carb, high sugar cake? There is an alternative. Yeah, my daughter has to cook um, gluten free and egg free. Right, yeah. and all of that. This, this recipe will take care of all that. So come next week and you all get a chance to see it. And I'll bring copies of the recipe, I guarantee you. Okay.